and support from Community for the Arts. The panel discussion will highlight local fine grains from respective countries or cities to stay together and revive. How the spirit of adversity and resilience translated into leadership and programs over overcoming pandemic in Southeast Asian contexts. How value, measurement, and approach changed in 2020. And what are these lessons from a year-long survival from the art sector? Does the impact bring radical takeaways for the future of art sector and society? Okay. Now, we have already our speakers from uh, four uh, art institutions in Southeast Asia. We have Mr. Aaron Sito from Museum Machan, Ms. Alia Swastika from uh, Yayasan uh, Biennale Yogyakarta. We have uh, Maria, Zos Ms. Jos Maria Zoselina Cruz from uh, MSAT uh, Philippines and Mr. Russell Storer from NGS Singapore. And our moderator from today is Mr. Benjamin Ham from the Asian Foundation. From, without further ado, Ben, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Widi. And uh, good afternoon to our guests from across Southeast Asia and beyond. On behalf of Museum Machan and the ASEAN Foundation, thank you for joining today's conversation. We appreciate you spending your precious time with us this weekend. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, uh, established in 1967, has facilitated people exchange in the sector in the last 15 years, ASEAN relinquished this role, an important aspect of its community building aspirations, allowing a proliferation of Asian biennales, art fairs, and maturing cultural institutions, including art centers and museums, to serve its functions in its stead. This unique space for artistic discourse that allowed for pluralistic notions of what constituted a regional artistic identity and aesthetic is one of ASEAN's great legacies and is widely acknowledged by a new generation of art historians and curators. In 2019, the Republic of Korea celebrated 30 years of diplomatic relations with ASEAN, a partnership that was established at the end of the Cold War. Also in 2019, Connect ASEAN was established, a multinational arts program funded by the ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund and administered by the ASEAN Foundation. As the post-Cold War reality of a new world has taken shape and formed new directions and conversations, Connect ASEAN heralds a new era of cultural diplomacy and regional integration, signaling both ASEAN's eagerness to revitalize its once integral role in the contemporary arts and Korea's sincerity in establishing closer ties with ASEAN. Connect ASEAN, in partnership with Museum Machan, is very pleased to convene this highly distinguished panel of speakers in conjunction with the upcoming Stories Across Rising Lands exhibition. This collaborative project, originally scheduled to launch late last year, has been our own pandemic-tainted lesson in dealing with the new normal, if you will. If 2020 has taught us anything as individuals, as communities, as nations. Creativity and collaboration is key to our survival. Our format for today will include short presentations by each of our speakers about their respective Southeast Asian arts institutions, followed by a panel discussion outlining responses to the pandemic and future organizational strategies, and then concluding with a Q&A session. To begin the presentations, we are joined by Aaron Sito, the director of our host institution, Museum Machan in Jakarta, Indonesia. Aaron was formerly curatorial manager of Asian and Pacific art at the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane and director of Sydney's 4A Centre for Contemporary Asian Art, both located in Australia. Please join me in welcoming Aaron to the screen. Uh, thank you, Ben. Thanks for the introduction and uh, great to see everybody here. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have at the end of it. But to begin, I thought that what I would do is to share um, uh, a PowerPoint 
um, which really looks at the um, not only the approach that the that Museum Machan has taken in terms of its its programming, but also uh, I hope gives a little bit of the context, both the context in the city of Jakarta, um, and uh, which really led uh, lots of the approaches that we took as we were were uh, navigating the um, uh, the COVID situation, and which we are continuing to navigate. So, um, so firstly, you know, we're, we're nearly approaching 12 months, um, and an our first anniversary of the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that we can all better understand how our daily lives have changed and the many challenges that we face as we adapt to this very inelegant term, the new normal lifestyle. Uh, in this short, very, very short period of time has been an extraordinary upheaval of, of our regular processes and, and practice within the museum. Uh, keep in mind that, that Museum Achan is a very new organization. We were established in November 2017. And so all of our planning around our, our future sustainability really um, was what was, was significantly, significantly impacted. So everything has turned upside down the way that we deliver programs from exhibitions, how we deliver our art education, um, even how we identify our audiences and our constituencies. It's an, a landscape where the physical engagement has rapidly been subsumed by ideas and experimentation with the digital. I think it's important to give a little bit of the, of the global context. And so here on this slide, um, it, it comes from a report that was published by UNESCO in May, 2020, and it's, um, it is called the impact of museums around the world in the face of COVID-19. Um, so there are two key takeaways, I think, from, from uh, this report. I believe that it has been updated uh, since this time. But what from, from March 2020, uh, about 90% of the world's museums closed their doors. And they expect that 10% might not reopen after this whole pandemic. So that's one, I think, very, very stark um, reality which we have to be aware of. The other one is that as we shift to the digital, that there is a massive digital digital div divide, that there are, are challenges with how our audiences access culture. Um, and I, th I think for an organization that is based in um, uh, in a developing country like Indonesia, and also for an organization that is very concerned about art education. These are things that need to be to be understood internally so that we can reconcile them within our program. So, so one of the things that I th think that is really clear is that actually the full impact on museums and institutions is yet to be completely understood. Um, and even though that we talk about the 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 drive to the in, to the digital how institutions will experiment and adapt will be modulated by the by range of social and economic factors, um, such as how widespread and available technology is, and also the literacy and the proficiency of the community to harness the technologies as they come about. And I think that this understanding of the socioeconomic context is really important because um, in my opinion, greater awareness of the socioeconomic inequities and biases which frame participation is necessary for a number of reasons, not just for pragmatic planning and development of future um, activities for the institution, but also it gives us reason to pause and to think carefully about the function and the role of our institutions in society and the assumptions that we, we um, sometimes unconsciously make about the role of culture and art in education into the future. So let me um, return to uh, Jakarta. We are, the museum is based in Jakarta. We're based in uh, the West, in West Jakarta. In Jakarta itself, there are about 10 and a half million uh, citizens. And prior to the, um, the pandemic, it, had, it fluctuated by about 20 million day, day to night. So that there was, it, Jakarta itself is, is a big city. So the impact of, of the pandemic is, is, is also on its, uh, potentially on its population. And these are quite current figures as well. At the moment, there are about 3,000 uh, plus COVID-19 uh, infections daily. And I think let's also now look at the, the role of uh, the internet uh, and how Indonesian audiences actually use the internet. So Indonesia as a massive population has 
also quite a lot of internet users. There's up to 100 million internet users. And then we've, we've, we've then, um, uh, my education team who have pulled together these, these uh, figures also illustrate that uh, even though there are lots of people who act, can access the, the internet, when it comes to the learning environment, there is a massive um, barrier for, for people to also access it. So perhaps only 25% of students in cities and urban areas have access to the computer, to computers and, and internet. Um, so this, uh, for, for an organization which, which um, seeks to have that public interface, when we can no longer see the public and we're, we're seeking to engage with them in, in, new method, in, new, in new ways, we all have to understand that there are, there are inherent privileges within, um, within, the, um, within those methods. So Museum Machan, well, we've been closed since the 4th of, 14th of March in 2020. We had just opened two major exhibitions, a survey exhibition of Malati Siridamo and a really large and important video installation by the German artist Julian Rosefeld. Um, we opened our doors, 11 days later, we closed our, closed our doors. And it was a, the impact was, was um, uh, for, you know, for, for it was it was a very difficult decision to make. Uh, we were aware that uh, the artists spend lots of time and energy and resources in thinking about and and working with us to create exhibitions. And the decision to close is um, it, it impacts it impacts them in very very deep ways. And also then as a result, um, like many many. Uh, organizations around the world, we began to develop a museum from home uh, program. Uh, and we've developed other projects where we are working with the community to, to raise uh, money and awareness for our, our artist community and lots of, lots of other uh, projects, which I'll talk a little bit about shortly. And hopefully um, we will be able to, to physically reopen again soon. We were hoping, um, actually our, our date was next weekend, but unfortunately because of the, the current conditions in Jakarta, our physical reopening date is, has been pushed a little bit further into the future. So our Museum from Home program has a number of really important principles. Issues around accessibility, and I, and I showed those figures and, and um, uh, the, those kind of socio socioeconomic barriers right at the beginning to underline un underline how we think about um, accessibility. We also uh, there was also a process of reviewing internally what we had already done because the the impact the, the shift to digital is not just it, it's not as easy as just turning on a digital tap. I mean, um, uh, it requires lots of resources and time and staff time to uh, digitize material. So we took the, the attitude that we would uh, work with what we had first so that we could get what we had to those who already, already um, who, who, who needed it most. And then thirdly, uh, social media. I mean, ever since the museum, museum opened in 2017, social media has been very important to us in a, in a country like uh, Indonesia and even in a city like Jakarta where it's very difficult to uh, normally cross the city, social, me social media becomes really important. Um, it also, from, that, from the socioeconomic um, viewpoint, it also helps to cut across uh, lots of those barriers as well because of the relative inexpense of social media. So the museum right from 2017 has been, has really embraced social media and we continue to do so through our uh, how we imagine what our programs will look like into the future. And it's paid off. So uh, that's probably one of the silver linings of the whole uh, program shift to the digital is that actually we get to engage with more people across a much broader geography. Um, Indonesia, I mean, I showed the st statistics earlier about Jakarta, but Indonesia itself is also a massive population. It's, it's over a quarter of a billion people spread across um, uh, a, a very, a very large and complicated geography. So the our, our program, um, there are, we, we have a number of examples where we've been able to engage with different people in different regions through the through the online. 
And here's a, a really ba a very, very basic snapshot of what I think is some really um, uh, good successes for a small, young organization. Um, and I'm, I'm really, if you look in the, in the middle and, and, and the right hand um, panel, I think that these are the, these are the really interesting statistics. Uh, we developed a online audio guide based on our collection and we did it online using uh, IGTV because we knew that it wasn't a heavy um, it wasn't a heavy program so that if you were sitting at home you didn't have to to deal with technology glitches in order to in engage with the engage with the material we wanted to create the very uh, that, that very uh, straightforward nexus between the museum the content and the audience and we're really i'm, I'm really uh, proud about this statistic that uh our uh, one of the works in the collection our aramayani painting a very very important um painting in her career received a, over has received over 30 37 000, um uh li people listening to it uh, since since march um we also do programs at one of our other pro podcast programs called uh, machan a to z which is a, a short 40 minute to 60 minute uh, program has been downloaded uh, 7,000 times in, in, in that period of time. And I think that this goes to show that, I mean, we would never have 7,000 people in, in our, in um, uh, list, uh, coming to, to, to see a, a public program. And it would be very difficult in our normal, um, in a normal situation to be, to be sharing information about an artwork 37,000 times. Okay, one of the things that we did very early on in the program and is to uh, find ways in which we could support the artist community using the infrastructure of the museum to do so. Uh, very early on, we understood that it wasn't just us, the museum, who was being impacted by it, but the but the core core, core our core constituencies who we who we engage with on a day to day. Um, um, day to day, we're also struggling. So we developed a program through our development team called Arisan Karia, and it was a three-part art drive. We, we, we emphasized the word drive because it was a way of, being, of us, the museum, being able to connect artists with uh, support, direct support from the, from the community. And it, and it op operated like a raffle. So it ran over three months, uh, every month, um, uh, artists uh, put, put forward work and then um, it averaged out to be about 100 works per edition. So we then sold 100 coupons at uh, 1 million rupiah each. And then uh, there was a live program where that money went, went, um, uh, went back to the, to the artists. A very, very simple exchange uh, project, but it was it was a way to be able to connect people. It was a way to be able to give a little bit of, of positivity in, in, in a, during a pretty dark time. And it was also a way in, where we were able to mobilize our sponsors. So for instance, one of our sponsors came on board and decided that one of what they wanted to do was to prepare care packages, um, basic food, foodstuffs that could be distributed to the artists who, who participated uh, in, in the program. And then those artists, if they required it, they could use it themselves, or then they could continue to distribute that material back through the community. And I think that this is, um, um, something that was really important, a very, very important initiative that we did in 2020. Sorry, Aaron, uh, one more minute for you. Okay, okay. So I, I want to I um, end on where we're thinking in terms of our, how we engage with the public in the future. It's what we call a hybrid approach. And again, it's not a very elegant, um, it's, a very, it's a very, very straightforward um, uh, way of describing it. We have to marry the digital with the physical. And, we, and the digital no longer comes second to the experience of work, but we're um, working with artists in order to sometimes refigure programs. Um, we, have to, we have to enter into new, into new um, partnerships. Uh, here with this, with this our Children's Art Space Commission, the UOB um, uh, Children's Art Space Commission uh, with Chitra Sazmita, a physical presentation, which we hope to open in, in uh, shortly. Uh, virtual experience, so lots of activities online, um, web AR and digital on online engagement. Um, quickly, you can look at this on, on our website of, uh, as well. Uh, um, projects where there is uh, storytelling using, using social media. 
hash, um, uh, filters. Uh, but I just want to, I'm just going to quickly um, go to this slide. I think that the things that we've, we've learned, I think that there are probably five key things that we've learned from, from last year is that you have to be really conscious about resourcing and planning. Um, digital is not simple. Uh, it actually requires lots of time. You have to think about the capacity of your audiences. So there's no point in us creating uh, really heavy uh, digital assets, videos, et cetera, if our audiences aren't able to, to um, engage with them. So we, we, we're very conscious about who we're talking about. We wanna harness the existing platforms that we already use. So social media becomes really important in that, in that way. Partnerships are key because uh, there's lots of things which technology companies understand about technology, which museums don't. So, um, and it, it, it opens up really fascinating conversations between artists and with the technology companies and with the museum to do things differently and to do things better. And we're constantly experimenting with, with process. So this is what we're, we're thinking about, but maybe by, by the middle of the, of the year, um, our process will be very, very, may look very, very different. Thank you, and that's it from me. Thank you very much, Aaron, uh, and for sharing some of those uh, wonderful uh, examples of uh, the museum becoming a, a catalyst to, to uh, bring the community together, especially during times of crisis. Uh, I think that's a very important point to make. So uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, we shall now go on to our next speaker, uh, Alia Swastika, the director of the Jokja Biennale Foundation in Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, previously, Alia was the program director of Arc Gallery in Jakarta and was involved in numerous curatorial projects, including the co-artistic director of the ninth Gwangju Biennale Roundtable in Korea in 2012. In 2017, she curated the contemporary arts section for the Europalia Festival Indonesia edition, which toured to various locations throughout Belgium and Europe. Please join me in welcoming Alia to the screen. Yeah. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me to this important meetings. And I'm very glad to see you all here, all the colleagues that it's been almost two years I haven't seen everyone here. So uh, thank you very much also to Aaron for a very uh, detailed explanation and presentation about the situation in Indonesia, particularly in Jakarta and the, the very important data about how the Indonesian people uh, using the digital media and how digital media become like not only the secondary platform after all the physical activities uh, become limited, but I think also uh, to maximize the negotiation and also how we connect with the audience. I think uh, the situation in Jakarta is a bit different from uh, what Aaron has explained about, about Jakarta because since the beginning of the pandemic, actually the people in Jogja as always was quite slow about it. So in the, I think the first three months in Jogja, the numbers of the people infected by the virus was very low. And that's also uh, affected the way people perceive the, the pandemic situation. I think after the Ramadan, after Idul Fitri, it seems like normal situation come back uh, as before. People started to go out and uh, they started also to have activities outside and even some exhibition started to happen. So in Biennale Yogyakarta, I think also quite different because we don't really have the space. I think it will be very different approach on how we uh, respond to the pandemic because all the other institution here, actually you have uh, the space where usually people visit and see exhibition. While for us, it's more like event. So the office of the Biennale Jogja Foundation actually uh, more programming, uh, smaller scale activities. Uh, so we don't really have all the audience to come to our small office, but it's more limited that is in a way it's one of the, the benefit also in responding to the uh, pandemic situation. 
And luckily as well, uh, the last edition of the Biennale just finished uh, December 2019. So uh, throughout the 2020, we don't really have a big exhibition to be programmed. So that is quite one thing that uh, we consider we were lucky. Uh, usually when we don't have the exhibition, we don't have the Biennale, we organize what's so-called a symposium equator and this is also part of how we try to contribute more to the production of knowledge, to the distribution of knowledge, because in Yogyakarta also, we work a lot uh, with universities. So the symposium, we organize more to connect artists, researchers, scholars, academics, and uh, we did in the end of the year, usually uh, October. So yeah, actually as physical activities, we don't, really have a big we don't we didn't really have big problems throughout the 2020 but then we also came to the question how we can preparing the next edition of uh, Biennale Jogja uh, equator series because uh, I think one of the fact that we have to underline also this year 2021 will be the last edition the first round of uh, Biennale Jogja equator after we did uh, five editions of uh, going around the world within the equator lines, now we will be closing the first round with the 2021 edition. And during October, we were really hoping that the situation will be better. <laughs> but then, yeah, I think in December, then we realized that it will take so much longer time to be able to uh, create a normal programming. And I think, that is quite uh, difficult in terms of organizing the event that being part of like festival platform. So I think it's quite different from other Biennale uh, formats in other countries. The Biennale Jogja is maybe one of the biggest uh, exhibition in Yogyakarta and maybe also one of the biggest in Indonesia that is uh, somehow the history of the making, the history of the establishment also very much connected to the idea of festivity, which is also always talking about like how many audiences coming to the festival and then how uh, we can connect not only with artists who practice contemporary art, but also all those artists who live in the villages and other uh, remote areas in Yogyakarta. So maybe for some of uh, them who's not uh, haven't been to Fisi Jogja uh, or the Biennale, we can play the video to give the idea or the illustration how it is very important the outgoing uh, activities and also connection with community. Uh, Widi bisa bantu play videonya.
Yeah. I think from the video, uh, we can see how physical activities, the real physical meetings and encounters between the artists and uh, organizers and the community itself become one of the core and the most important uh, ideas or exchange that happening uh, during a decade. So we are now reaching the 10 years of Biennale Jogja. And Actually, for the uh, to, for the ending or uh, for closing of the first round of the Biennale Jogja, we will be working with countries uh, in Pacific. So we were in the process of researching uh, if we would working with islands or uh, countries to pass pass by the idea of a nation state and instead talking about nation state as before we talk more about uh, ethnicity or island. So that is something that uh, we are still in discussions, but yeah, it will be with Pacific, but at the same time also we, we, we will create like a retrospective exhibition where we will invite the other, uh, the previous part, country past partners and curators to have like archival exhibition and also to present some of the previous works that has been exhibited in the past year. So the idea is having two different uh, exhibition of the Pacific, Indonesia and Pacific artists and also the closing up or not really conclusion, but it's kind of like to putting all together different ideas coming from the equator first to the equator fifth and then now with the Pacific so it, uh, during the experience of organizing the Biennale, uh, mobility become one of the most important method for us. So it's always like uh, residencies and sending artists and curators to the country partners and to Saversa where we invited artists and curators from the country partner to come and to stay in Jogja is one of the highlight of our program because we came and invite artists that is never really have the connection with contemporary art before, like artists from Nigeria or artists from Brazil. So it was very exciting and also at the same time, almost unknown territory for us because we never really worked with them before. But it turned yeah, out- yeah, that, one minute. <laughs> okay. But it turned out all this exchange become something that uh, we enjoy really much. So I don't know with the situation now, uh, we are still trying to get the possibility to be able uh, working on residencies to Pacific. And I heard that some of the islands in the Pacific, actually they don't even affected by the virus, but the problem is not only where we are going to go, but also how the authority in Indonesia also have like very limited uh, restriction about the traveling. So we might think about uh, the definition of the idea of traveling itself. And also uh, what is the meaning of exchanging with, uh, because when we talk about Pacific also, we start to talk about indigenous culture and how we can go digital <laughs> with the indigenous culture. So there are so many questions and challenges that we are still uh, discussing about it. But yeah, I think uh, for the preparation of uh, the Biennale itself, we will be more working on all those archives that we collected during uh, 10 years of uh, organizing the Jogja Biennale Equator. And at the same time, thinking about the most possible methods to work with countries in Pacific area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alia, for sharing uh, the good work uh, you and the Biennale is doing. And I, uh, I really like this, uh, that you included the words gathering and friendship in your video and uh, thinking about the overarching theme of the equator uh, uh, that the Biennale is working on and, and ASEAN itself being an outcome of those solidarity groups of the mid 20th century. Um, I really, um, I think that the work that you are doing is very, very important, and of course, uh, very much in theme with, um, uh, with what uh, we are facing in our, 
you know, in contemporary times. So um, uh, without, anyway, thank you, Alia. Without further ado, let's go on to our next guest, um, uh, Rosalina Cruz, uh, who is currently the director and curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art and Design, or MCAD, at the De La Salle College of St. Benild in Manila, in the Philippines. Uh, Rosalina has worked as a curator for the Lopez Memorial Museum, sorry, Memorial Museum, rather, in Manila, and the Singapore Art Museum, and the Philippine Pavilion for the 57th Venice Biennale in Italy in 2017. Please join me in welcoming Rosalina to the screen. Oh, you're on mute, Rosalina. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you for having me and thank you for um, inviting me, Aaron and Ben, to be part of this. Um, I, I was speaking with Aaron and I realized that very few people actually know about MCAD, I think, uh, in Indonesia. So I was thinking I'd give a, an overview of what we do. And then uh, maybe later uh, with questions, talk. Uh, insert during the conversation what we've been doing during the pandemic. Uh, we were really caught flat-footed uh, <laughs> when the pandemic, I guess, with everybody else. But I think more so me, because I just got back from um, a six-month uh, fellowship. And when I came in, the whole thing closed. So we, um, we were in the middle of uh, preparations for exhibitions. But before that, I'd like to... Um, uh, share my screen and give an introduction to, to MCAD very quickly. So uh, for those who've not been, been to MCAD, this is, we're part of the College of St. Benild, as Ben has uh, uh, shared. And it's, uh, uh, it's a, a LaSalle Brothers uh, Catholic uh, educational institution. So what uh, MCA, what Benild has is a design of an arts uh, college where they offer um, art, fine arts and a lot of um, new media um, uh, work for, for students. But they do have the Museum of Contemporary Art and Design, which was, um, let's just go. There. The Museum of Contemporary Art and Design was uh, initially opened in 2007 together with the rest of um, the college and it was headed by the uh, theorist Marianne Pastor Rosses and she ran the museum uh, for two years. It was essentially, I, I don't want to re read this, but uh, it exists as the professional face of the School of Art and Design in the area of arts and culture. And it's distinct for its position as a non-collecting institution. Unlike Machan and uh, NGS and a lot of other museums, we do not have a, a collection. So we work as a like a Kunsthalle uh, type uh, space. Um, and as such, we offer uh, our stakeholders programming and content that encourages engagement with art and culture, its practice and production, as well as its presentation and interpretation, hoping to, hoping to set standards in exhibiting contemporary art locally. So we continue to uh, build on this current programming by creating an innovative and inclusionary paradigm where free access for all addresses a cross section, not only of social classes and of knowledges. Before I left, we had already changed our uh, thinking uh, in the museum, instead of uh, going towards education, we'd already expanded into thinking about the idea of learning um, and being and working with our audience uh, towards uh, the sort of programming that we would be uh, sharing in the museum. So there you go. So this is the space here in Manila, and this is the ground floor uh, of MCAD, and this is how it is when it's empty. For those who've not been here, Ilya, <laughs> yeah, I don't think you've been here yet, no? Uh, this is how our space looks like. It's one space. Uh, we have a mezzanine up above. Uh, it's a bit too much like a um, uh, glass box because it's open on the left-hand side. It's all windows. Usually during exhibitions, we don't see that because we board that up but it's very well lit. It's a, there's a lot of light in the space. Um, this was one of our first shows. Uh, we st I, want, I wanted to group uh, the talk as to the sort of 
artists we show and the sort of uh, exhibitions that we've had. I start with uh, showing that the first sort of shows that we've been having, we've had in the past and we continue to do so are were group exhibitions, mostly which were um, local and regional to begin with, the first few exhibitions. And then we started moving into the area of uh, new media uh, and videos. So these were the first few shows we had. We, had, we worked with Michael Lee, um, uh, Felix Papalor, Tiffany Chong, the first few exhibitions. Um, then we had Maria Taniguchi. Then we had uh, At Makulangan. We were working with a lot of new media because the space could handle it. And this is one of the few spaces in Manila which actually has this height and scale to uh, work with uh, this sort of um, sort of uh, practice. Uh, the height of the space is 8.5 meters, almost nine if you count the bit above. And uh, the space is basically just a thousand, uh, bit under a thousand square meters. Um, so we, uh, one of the first group shows we did, as uh, Aaron was saying, was uh, how partnerships are important. And we started working on partnerships early on uh, in 2013. I came in in 20, uh, late 2011, 2012, where we worked with uh, Jim Thompson Art Center. And we worked with two very young curators, Awuratep and Somsarit. Um, putting together an exhibition that they had already shown at Jim Thompson. So these were works. This is a work by Navindra Wanchai Kool that we brought in in 2013. A work by um, Chris Chong Chan Fui. Uh, this is a, also we were experimenting MCAD, right? So, and this is again, one of the biggest losses of, uh, of, um, of the pandemic, I think with all of us is the loss of engagement with space because we would experiment with how to put together exhibitions or work with the artists towards presenting their uh, work. And this was a work by Akiri Delena where we produced uh, her, sh her uh, video and projected it uh, in a three screen, the first time we ever did that. <laughs> <laughs> and for her as well. Uh, this work by Julian Roosevelt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't realize that that's who you worked with, Aaron. So this was uh, in 20, late 2013, 2014. Uh, we had an all video exhibition uh, for the first time. We had seven, 15 or I don't know, several ar artists. Uh, cu I curated it with uh, Claire Carolyn, a British um, curator. It was called Surface of the World and it was exploring the idea of film and architecture. We had Julian Roosevelt amongst others. Uh, this is a work that we started working with local. Um, one of our programming was to work, uh, was to have one full exhibition engaging with in large scale with local artists. And this is a work by Kawai and Digia, which I think, uh, uh, Russell must be quite familiar with because this is in the collection of the Singapore Art Museum now, at well, least the NGS. So this one, uh, this is work by Pia Abad. This is in the same show. Uh, it was a uh, sixteen, uh, sixteen artists, and we were in exploring a particular generation of uh, Filipino artists who are producing work. Um, I know le 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 level of uh, international and globalism. Uh, the next one of our group shows we've been working with, this is a work by the Achillesans. Um, it was called Cent The Center Will Not Hold. It was a political a commentary on the local uh, politics in, in the Philippines. <laughs> to be very careful about what I say, uh, in the Philippines uh, at that time. So it was really a critique of power where we had uh, this work by the Achillesan, a work by uh, Manny Mondalibano. Um, so this was uh, in the space. A work by Tintin Wulia, which uh, critique power by Shilpa Gupta. Um, so these were all, and this is another group show that we had with Lani Maestro and um, Manuel Ocampo. Uh, this was a show that was in Venice that I curated and we brought back to Manila um, to share with the local um, public. This is another work by Melanie Maestro. 
uh, and the last, the, this was one of our last shows that we had, the group shows was uh, by, this is a work by Mel Callahan, who's an Australian artist. And we worked with Artspace Sydney to produce this exhibition. Uh, this was, we had four artists here. One of us, Mello Callahan, Suzanne Treister, um, uh, Lorraine Lor Grasso, uh, and Pamela Rosencrantz. It's work by Pamela. And this was another show that we had, uh, all uh, Asian artists. Uh, this was a uh, work by, uh, Chao Yu Cheng was curated the, together uh, with um, Esther Liu. Uh, work by Tomarama, which we produced and commissioned for Manila. This is a beautiful work. And I thought this was quite interesting because it was already working with online um, algorithms. And we were, I think we're going to be working again in the future, working from this point. Um, uh, work by Gary Ross Pastrana. Uh, then I go to the other set of uh, artists that we work with, the other set of exhibition uh, we do at MCAD is we work with solo exhibitions, solo artists. Uh, so this is a work, the first one we did was with Paul Pfeiffer uh, called The Vitruvian Figure and we produced, we commissioned uh, a sculpture and a video with him. And then we worked with uh, Michael Lin, second, and then a Pichapong with Rosita Cool, which was a traveling show, but we reworked it for this space. And then Pasita Abad, the first uh, artist we worked with who was not no longer alive, <laughs> our first dead artist in the museum. Um, and uh, then that was the last uh, sh uh, show we had of a solo artist. Then the the show that was cut after having run for, I think, a month. So we had more, more a month on you, uh, <laughs> Aaron, than your 11, 11 days, was a video exhibition. It was a video exhibition, which luckily was a video exhibition because we were able to uh, move the works which were in on show in the museum online. So we could share this as one, it was actually almost seamless to a degree. Uh, so we had works by uh, Tao Nguyen Phan, uh, Minerva Cuevas, uh, James Kinitz uh, Wilkins, uh, uh, Ho Tsun Yen, uh, and amongst a whole lot of other people. And we were able to ask permission from these artists if we could actually show them online on YouTube. And we were, most of them actually said yes. And we were able to share this on YouTube for, for 24 hours. And I think it was so Selena, one more minute. Okay. And then um, after this, I just want to share the sort of works outside of the solo shows. We also had this um, initiative where we would go outside of uh, Manila and we would have uh, exhibitions in other spaces. It was really to uh, now that you can't do that anymore. You can't really go around and look at other spaces for this. So we had Himan Chong's uh, Library of Unread Books. These were really projects. And then we also showed um, Shirin Eshat Stuba, uh, which was really engaging with uh, the South of the Philippines. Uh, these are other uh, events that we'd have in, in their space, which of course, maskless. <laughs> Uh, and then we also have conversations with this. I wanted to bring this out because what we did was we initiated a hashtag MCAD cookies, where we uh, shared all of these archival uh, lectures that we had and conversations we had online. And these are all available um, for specific weeks during the last 12, I can't, I can't believe it's almost, it's already 12 months, Aaron, that we've been on lockdown. The museum continues to be closed, but we do have a show that we worked on during the pandemic. Um, I didn't know if I should share the entire experience of putting up a Hegu Yang show during the pandemic at the height of GCQ here in the Philippines, um, but we actually did it. And uh, so this is the rest, these are other stuff that we, we were doing and we were hoping to push for uh, this year, you know, barring the pandemic, but we were able to uh, put together this show by Hegu, this wonderful work by Hegu Young 
where we produce six sculptures. And maybe I'll share it later uh, when we talk uh, in depth about how we went about doing it. Uh, so yeah, so this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Rosalina, for uh, this uh, introduction to NCAD for our audience. Um, I, I particularly uh, like the Pachita Abad project that you have done. Uh, if, if I may share, this uh, 2021 is the 20th anniversary of the ASEAN Gallery. Uh, back in 2001, uh, the then Secretary General uh, Rodolfo uh, Severino of ASEAN uh, was very close to Pachita Abad and um, had an artwork by Pachita donated to the ASEAN Secretariat. So uh, I, I would love to share the work with you sometime. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, let's move on to our uh, uh, last presentation and representing our last institution is uh, Russell Storer, the Director uh, Curatorial and Collections at the National Gallery Singapore. Uh, previously, he was Head of Asian and Pacific Art at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art Brisbane and Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Sydney, both located in Australia. Please uh, join me in welcoming Russell to the screen. Uh, thanks, Ben, and thank you to you and Aaron for the invitation as well. It's a real pleasure to be here with old friends and colleagues. And I guess one of the benefits of, well, one of the things that come out of this is this opportunity to share on Zoom. I think we've done a number of these conversations in different configurations over the past year, um, but it's great to share in this context. Um, I've got a few slides, so Widi, would you be able to do that? I'm more confident with you doing it than me. Okay, please wait for a while. Yeah. So I'll just give a brief introduction to National Gallery Singapore. I mean, I'm not sure how many people in Indonesia are familiar, um, but just to, and then I'll sort of move into some of the initiatives that we've undertaken um, over the past year. So this is National Gallery, a very glamorous photograph. Um, we're a fairly new institution. We um, opened to the public at the end of 2015. So we've been open for five years, um, but we did take on when we began a, quite a substantial national collection of art from across Southeast Asia. So it's quite a unique in collecting institution in the region in that it has a regional focus rather than just a national focus. Um, so since the 1960s, um, Singapore has been collecting um, modern and contemporary art from across Southeast Asia. And um, since the gallery opened, if you can just go to the next slide, um, we've been able to present um, this collection yeah, in uh, two permanent, um, semi-permanent um, exhibitions, uh, which look at the development of modern art um, in Singapore and Southeast Asia since the 19th century. So this is an image of our long-term exhibition of Southeast Asian art. Um, so, so you can see Rudd and Saleh um, featured very prominently at the back, as well as you know, Hidalgo and, and uh, Juan Luna and other artists from the Philippines. So um, it's a way for us to really situate Singapore within the region. And um, I mean, it's a very small country in comparison to Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, um, and it also has the, I guess, the fun, funds and the infrastructure to be able to develop a museum of this scale and a collection of this type. Um, so that's been a very important, um, uh, I think, a project for Singapore over a long period of time. And it's been uh, really valuable as a hub, I think, um, for the region as well. Uh, if you just go to the next slide. So part of our exhibition program, besides the long-term exhibitions, is um, large, you know, temporary exhibitions. Um, we've done a number over the last five years. Um, but I guess our mission, in a sense, is to position Singapore and Southeast Asian art within a regional and a global context. So this is an exhibition um, that looked at um, socially engaged art in Asia from the 1960s to the 1990s, and that was um, done in collaboration with the Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo and the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Seoul. And from the outset, we've been working collaboratively as well, touching on the, you know, what um, the other speakers have mentioned, the importance of collaborations, um, both regional and international. So we've really worked very closely with a number of institutions um, around the world and around Southeast Asia to um, 
really present you know a range of uh, I guess takes or aspects um, that really are aiming to sort of develop research into what's still a very growing area of scholarship on Asian art. I'll just go to the next slide. Um, so this is one of our most recent, I guess, blockbuster exhibitions, which was looking at minimalism. So it was looking at, I guess, one of the things we've been trying to do is to look at, say, global movements of modernity or this sort of global history of, of modernism, which tends to be very Euro-American, and then reconsider it um, from the perspective of Southeast Asia. So, and so this was an opportunity to position, say, um, artists from Korea, for example, and Japan in relation to um, you know, American art and to look at the influence of say Zen Buddhism on American artists as well as the relationship um, across kind of cultures and to really re recast, I guess, minimalism as a, a very cross-cultural movement that continues into the present. But of course, these large scale exhibitions are very um, logistically heavy. They require movement of artworks and people and dozens of careers in this case, which of course, since COVID has been brought to a screeching halt. And um, since, I mean, Singapore went into about two months lockdown in April to June last year, and the gallery was closed during that period. But since June, we've been uh, open um, with obviously social distancing and various um, kind of people management um, since then. So we've been able to really function uh, physically uh, in, similarly in a, in a way. I mean, we've still opened exhibitions, we've still run programs, but of course, in a very curtailed fashion um, in terms of um, numbers of people who are allowed to come in. Um, programming had to go online um, almost entirely. It started to sort of open up again now. Um, and of course, we had two major international exhibitions last year that we had to cancel. They were impossible to continue because we couldn't bring couriers in or um, you know, move the artworks. So we've had to, we had to kind of rethink our program quite quickly. Um, if we just go to the next slide. So one of the things as we've all sort of mentioned is the move on to online, um, the sort of move to the digital. And we sort of went into quite a quick scramble. And um, although we had, you know, a digital sort of platform, it was fairly secondary um, to our physical platform for the most part. Um, and our website even wasn't really set up to take on a lot more digital content. So we've had to do a lot of very quick um, shifts and pivots in terms of how we work. Um, and I mean, Singapore does a lot of outsourcing. So we've had to work with a lot of uh, external organizations and companies to help us with that. And that's been really important. And the government stepped in very quickly to, um, you know, because a number of people were losing their, their jobs or to really provide, you know, job opportunities to various um, you know, companies and, and individuals. So there was uh, some of these digital projects were able to be um, supported by government funding, which was sort of brought in very quickly. So we also had a lot, number of con uh, a lot of content that we had recorded, um, but hadn't necessarily been put up on the website. So that was another thing that we sort of moved forward quite quickly. And having a little bit of a breather in a sense gave us a chance to sort of refocus and think about you know, what are some of the things that we need to prioritize now in this new context? Um, so one of the other things is digitizing our collection and really boosting our collection online presence. So that's been growing apace and has a lot more attention given to that. As well as bringing a lot of our public programs that we tend to film but hadn't really um, uploaded. So um, if you just go to the next slide. Um, so we set up a platform which we called Gallery Anywhere, which was kind of a, I guess, a hub for all of our digital content, um, whether it be the online collection and library and archive, um, our public programming, um, various interactives. So we've been working, um, I mean, we have a very active program for kids and families. So a lot of that, of course, had to become digital. So a lot of programming was developed um, for that, um, for those activities. And we just launched this week, actually, our annual festival, which was called Light Tonight, which is a sort of a family festival that's launched during Art Week. It's Art Week in Singapore here, um, which had, which is what, I mean, Aaron mentioned the very um, inelegant way of talking about the physical and the digital, but we came up with an even more inelegant term, the digital, 
which is the hybrid of the two. Um, and light tonight is, 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 is just that. So it's a number of um, physical kind of events and projects, which, um, you know, have to follow the various protocols, but with a much more ramped up website and um, digital content and interactive content, which we've developed. So it's a really new way of thinking about festival programming. So this has taken a lot of effort, a lot of time, and um, we weren't necessarily equipped entirely, and particularly within the curatorial team. I mean, we were really physical exhibition minded um, almost entirely. So we've had to really rethink how we plan and how we work. And um, but this takes a lot of time. So I guess we can talk about that a bit more in the conversation that follows. But I guess the scramble to sort of make sure that we had content online and we can keep engaging our audiences, particularly during the lockdown, we realized very quickly that it wasn't so easy and um, it takes a lot longer to produce, you know, quality content to be able to really, um, you know, develop programs and, and, and content that was really worthwhile and within a very crowded landscape, of course. So how do you promote it was also a big challenge. So how to activate social media, for example, um, so I've just go to the next slide. So one of the main initiatives that we developed uh, during this period, and I guess one of the big kind of questions that faced us with this new situation um, was, you know, what is the role of a museum in, in society now? I mean, it's a big question that's being asked around the world and obviously a number of social justice discussions and actions have been undertaken and it's really impacted on institutions across the globe in different ways. Um, but it really made us think very much about, you know, what kind of, I guess, citizen are we um, within our local landscape? You know, what can we do to support the local art community? So along with the Singapore Art Museum, which is our sister institution, um, we devised this project, um, which we called Proposals for Novel Ways of Being. And we reached out to um, a number of um, art spaces, museums, collectives, around the city, so from, you know, very small scale sort of artist run spaces to large museums like the National Museum, um, to invite them to participate um, in this and to develop a kind of a quick response project. It could take any form. Um, in some cases, it was part of the existing program that was sort of re reworked a bit. In others, it was, it was brand new. And the idea was to invite uh, young independent curators or, or independent curators who in turn would invite at least 10 um, artists to develop an exhibition. Um, and each would be paid a fee. Um, so it was a way to give a little bit of financial support. I mean, it wasn't huge, but it was something. And also just have an opportunity to develop projects that could reflect and provide a sense of community uh, during this time. So I'll just talk very briefly about the projects that we hosted at the gallery. So if we just go to the next slide. Uh, sorry, Russell, one yeah. more minute. One more minute. Okay, yeah. So just quickly scoot through these couple of slides. Um, so next. Uh, next. Yeah, so these are the partners. Uh, next. Yeah, so this is the exhibition that we uh, developed with a young curator, Shahida Iskandar. Um, she called it an exercise in meaning in a glitch season and in a sense, thinking about what we're going through as a glitch and, um, and how that has really forced us to reflect in a new way and, and to sort of really reconsider what things mean, um, you know, how we can find meaning in, in what we find in front of us. So I'll just go to the next slide. So I've just got some visual examples um, and some of the artists that we worked with. And this was developed in three months. So this is something that was quite radical. I mean, we tend to take two to three years to develop an exhibition. Um, we also very rarely work with young artists. So for all of these artists, it's their very first time working with the gallery. So this was a really fantastic opportunity for us to engage with a new art, kind of an art community that we hadn't necessarily engaged with as closely and to, um, be more improvisational and responsive in terms of how we work. So that was also quite interesting and had its own challenges. And besides that, we've had to split teams in terms of how we work. So having to work sort of one week on, one week off, partly distance, partly physical, was also had its own set of challenges as well. Um, but as you can see, the artists were really diverse, um, responding to you know this idea of, um, say, 
spaces of worship closing down, um, having to, you know, the, the ubiquity of QR codes. Of course, when you enter any building in Singapore, you have to scan yourself in um, for contact tracing. Um, so the visuals and the, the, the sort of ideas that came out of it became very much integrated into the exhibition. Um, so I think I have to finish. So I'll leave it there, but um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Russell. And uh, uh, I think, um, well, that concludes our presentations for now and uh, we will uh, move on to our, our panel discussion. But um, I think I would like to use um, a part of Russell's presentation to maybe leap into our first topic of discussion. Um, I mean, uh, here we are at the beginning of 2021, we're wedged in between the chaos of 2020 and the hope that the end of this pandemic is within sight, um, if not within reach. And uh, each of your institutions has dealt with the last, uh, you know, almost 12 months in very different ways. And um, maybe um, uh, looking at, say, Aaron's uh, point that 10% of museums may not open once the pandemic uh, uh, recedes. Um, if we look at our collective experience of border closures and lockdowns and global unrest that has been driven by fear of death and illness, I'd like to ask each of you, uh, thinking about um, all of this that we've just been through, what role does the institution or the arts institution have in sustaining our ecosystem uh, during and after times of crisis? And uh, I think we'll go in the same order as our presenters spoke. So we'll start with Aaron to respond to that question. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, I, I personally think that institutions have a really important role to play. I think that um, it's also something that, that Russell brought up very early in his presentation, or at some point in his presentation, that, that there's also a reassess, that, that it's an opportunity for, for us to reassess um, not just the the, the role that the museum plays as a kind of public space, but also its meaning um, as, a, as a public institution. So, so how we deal with um, uh, issues of racial injustice and economic injustice and all of these things. I think that these are really important conversations that are also happening now. It's not just the nuts and bolts of when or how we can reopen or what our programs might look like in the future, but also who do we serve? What um, what should our what should our who should our programs reflect? I think that these are really important um, uh, conversations that, that that really go to the the fundamental idea that art has a much broader uh, role to play within our societies. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Alia, would you like to respond to the question? Yeah, uh, I think from our experience as. Uh, I mean, even though in Jogja, uh, the situation where actually the ecosystem has to survive by themselves for such long time, like, uh, if we talk about the, the idea of infrastructure, for example, and uh, the support from the government, uh, we don't really have that anyway in, in Jogja for such long time. So I think in terms of the resilience of the ecosystem, uh, it's kind of like the way we operate in the art scene already. I think in the last uh, few decades, even like in the last 25 years, let's say. So in terms of the economic uh, situation for uh, young artists and mid-career artists, it is more that something delayed instead of uh, the loss of income, for example. So I think what we do in Biennale Jogja, uh, so we try to distribute the small funding we got from the government and it has to be underlined as well that as organization, the Biennale Foundation, actually we didn't get any uh, fund for organizational support from the government. So we got only the money if we create an event. So even for the officers and all the administration paying the bills, we don't get that from, from the government. So even that's quite tough for us. So every time we have to think about 
making uh, or creating the events that uh, where we can collect and collaborate with other institution and the younger generation for artists so they can get a smaller uh, budget from the government like uh, we we asked to the mess 56 for doing the uh, documentation and editing our videos so they got small money and then this kind of other things happen quite regularly recently. I think that's how we respond uh, spontaneously to the situation of the pandemic. And so far it works quite okay. Many artists also, they created lots of uh, way of fundraising in quite different ways. That is uh, showing the way we collaborate for the resilience. But we've been in this situation for quite some time anyway, so for us it's... <laughs> Thank you, Alia. Uh, Joselina? I, I just wanted to say that, I mean, I do agree with the fact that, it, I mean, the when the pandemic sort of happened, we did have the time in a way to start thinking what does an institution mean what do we mean fine i mean like finally we had to sit down like what do we mean when we have physically have people come and see us like even visit us and see the exhibitions that we put out uh with so much hard work i mean we all know how difficult it is to put up one show and um, i don't know or also if you've had a show where you open you i don't know if you had an opening because we, when we opened Hagi, we did have an opening where we mm. had. <laughs> so it, it's very strange because you sort of work towards this. Uh, that there's an apex of when you arrive, when you open a show, suddenly mm. everything's all worth it. But when you actually open a show without having that sort of mm. quick feedback, what you did for that show, that I think that becomes that's when you start realizing how effective or what is it, what is it that we're doing? Mm. I think on the same level, um, I think it's also important to figure out how important, how there's, there is so many, there's so many people who lost their jobs um, mm. um, during this time of pandemic, really. And I think a whole lot more uh, in the art, uh, in the art ecosystem. I think we have to think on those two levels. And as an institution, not only do we have to rethink conceptually as to how what we mean to the context that we live in or we exist. And I think now it's not just a local context, but because of all of the Zoom and the online engagement, it is a much bigger context that we work we actually engage in more um, and, and more indelibly really. Um, there is the need to make at least in uh, for for ourselves uh, we've had to start looking at how our exhibitions or our activities will function in a way that um artists are still engaged in our work not perhaps physically to put up exhibitions like what uh, i think NJ ngs has done uh, but at least to um <clears throat> for us <clears throat> we, I, I told um, Aaron, I shared this with Aaron la, uh, yesterday. I will be working with an exhibition with, uh, called Do It. I think a lot, most of the people in the art landscape already know about this uh, project. Uh, and we'll be working, we'll be bringing that to MCAD as a bridge to, to rethink how to subsist in this, in this, in this moment, in this condition where before we can even do physical exhibitions, which we are doing now because we're still close. I mean, we've opened in July in Singapore here, we're still close. Not, no, we're the only museum actually accepting private visits, mm. one or two. Um, and we're, we're going to use that as a way to experiment how to engage with both our, our audience the public and artists, and without too much, um, um, and I would think it's, there's, um, it's a light touch of trying to engage with local artists who also don't know where they'll be placing themselves in. So for the Do It exhibition, we'll try to, we'll be 
trying to figure out where things will move. I, I think this is the importance of what the art, an art institution, especially the one which, um, which still has the, um, the, to a degree, I mean, I don't know, but I think most art institutions, whether it's they say it or not, has had cuts. <laughs> and uh, that doesn't exclude us, no? But we still do have that. Uh, but by the fact that you continue to exist, I think there needs to be this uh, engagement with the uh, local uh, ecosystem. Thank you, Rosalina. Uh, Russell, would you like to add anything? To yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I'm sort of reiterate what everyone said, but I think, yeah, for us, I guess a, a major part has been this real much greater focus on local engagement. And I mean, we had a big tourist audience, for example, I mean, almost half, well, a third to a half was tourists. And of course, that's completely stopped. Um, I mean, we still have quite a generous audience as a big museum, but um, we've really... Um, we have thrown all our energies into into local engagement and, and it's brought forward uh, you know a lot of um, thinking I guess that had been latent or that we talked about maybe but had never really had the time or the energy to give to it so this has been really um, a moment to bring a lot of this forward and just responding to you know Yaya's comment about openings I mean, we don't have the big event um, but we do have what we call an open house where it's open sort of all day and in a way it sort of stretched out and slowed down the opening um, and you know the numbers are limited but you know the curators sort of there present all day and we talk and give tours to people as they come in so it's more of an intimate kind of engagement in a sense compared to a big party which of course is you know fun but um, I think that kind of to me sums up some of the differences in how we're trying to work with our exhibitions and say the Novel Ways exhibition, I mean, it, we had a series of conversations with the curator and different artists and across the different organisations. So we really boosted the programming and the, you know, the kind of discourse around the exhibition um, more than maybe we would, um, you know, or it's been spread out through the show rather than maybe one sort of symposium around the opening, for example. So I think it's given a chance for this closer kind of thinking. Um, but it'll take time. I mean, a number of these other things will, particularly to do with social justice and really rethinking, um, you know, these longer term, deeper issues of systemic discrimination and so on, um, will take a lot of time to work through, but it's definitely brought these conversations forward. Thank you, Russell. Um, I, I think I'd just like to maybe uh, draw on a comment that Alia made that the, you know, during the pandemic, um, the Biennale Jokja took the opportunity uh, to actually focus on, on some work that uh, was outstanding, for instance, digitization, archiving, and um, you know, taking a, maybe a slower approach to, to work in general. Um, uh, perhaps, uh, well, thinking of this in mind, and well, with this in mind and with your institutions, um, was there anything on uh, that may have not been so high on your agenda, but was was there always that became, say, more important because of that pandemic? And uh, perhaps uh, we'll start with Aaron on this one. Lucky me. Um, I think <laughs> I, I think that the, the reality is that we everyone had to completely restructure how that they worked. Um, so that there's, I don't think that there was any part of the organisation that, that didn't have some level of thinking about is this a priority now? Can can we can we do this now? Because I mean, I, I'm I'm also I'm looking at one of the the questions in the in the chat box here too around impact on staff. I mean, that was that was one of the first things that we we really had uh, that that I was conscious about is that um, we had to completely rearrange all of our domestic arrangements in order to not just live at home, but work at home for some of us to educate kids at home. Um, there, there's, there was a, um, um, I think that there was a basic reappraisal of what needed to be done now. 
what we could do now, because I mean, it's all well and good to say, hey, let's digitize everything, but it takes time and it takes resources. Um, and how do you do that if you're not working in the office, if you don't have access to, to all of the, the uh, material or the equipment, everything had to be, everything has had to be uh, restructured then. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, yes, yes, Rosalina. I'm going to jump in. I mean, like uh, Aaron say, I mean, um, in Singapore, I think internet is probably more stable than in, in Manila. So when you're saying about how we're going, to, most of us are working from home. And we, if we start trying to upload stuff, it just starts breaking down. <laughs> and it's like, this is, a, this is a reality we all have to look at. And it's like, suddenly, shoot, we can't upload as much as we if we were working in the office where the bandwidth would be bigger and i mean just to share when we had a one of our uh, big initiatives was to put on an online a conversation with the four other institutions which had the hague exhibition so there's one in um where is that there's one in korea one in uh, this one at the day, there's one in canada and in manila so we all had this huge conversation it was initiated by us and it, was a, it wasn't a disaster. It was just like, it freaked us out because people were starting to, it, it, the, you know, the bandwidth started failing and there were all these people trying to jump in and um, sort of like start bugging everybody in the, in the conversation. People were shouting and, you know, so those things you can't really, you have to uh, figure out how to, go through it if you're not a poor i mean you don't know how you're going to do that if you don't have the the infrastructure of of of, of an office let's say and and that's been a challenge for us because we um i don't know if you go to work aaron do you guys go to work at all no working all the time <laughs> no, but that, that, we go to the museum we're all working from home at the moment yeah because we do have half so it, it's just, it's, it's a challenge. You're always juggling, at least for, for us. And it's, it's um, and you know, one, one team, somebody in the team has a really bad internet connection and that's it for her for the entire meeting, that's it. And it's, it's I think this, uh, the democracy of, of, of technology, <laughs> it, it um, Thank challenge. you, Rosalina. Um, Alia, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I think in a way I agree with uh, the issues that mentioned by Rosalina on how the democratization of technology and in the end now we also talk about democratization of the access to the arts. It's really uh, related to uh, our ability to access the technology itself and it's just uh, very strongly connected to the economy. So for example, uh, we are planning the, and budgeting for the next exhibition. And then I just talked to the guy who will be working on the technical uh, stuff. And then we found out it's just so expensive to move the exhibition from the physical space to the digital space. It will be, I think we will spend more than uh, forty percent of our budget just for paying the technology. So in this kind of thing also uh, give me questions on how the importance like to connect virtually in this uh, very specific situation. If we have another possibility, for example, to have connection with more local base community here, even though maybe the numbers of audience not so much uh, compared to the, the, the reach out of the virtual, but I think still important also to have the balance between the accessibility of technology and uh, like the sense of humanity when we have to divide our budgets to human resources or to the machine. I think that's still something that I'm thinking I'm trying to figure it out. And you, you heard the story, the sound of Giko before? <laughs> <laughs> Part of the soundscape. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alia. Uh, Russell, have you got anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, 
I mean, we've been lucky. I mean, we're lucky in Singapore. I mean, it's a, a wealthy country and there's quite a lot of financial support. So we haven't had to lose any staff. Um, but of course, there's an impact in how we've had to work. And we've yeah, been working from home really since April last year. And we've started to move back into a split team situation so we can go in 50%. Um, but yeah, it's put a lot of pressure on communication, you know, how, how to rethink how we communicate information, what kind of meetings. I mean, it's very kind of practical daily operational stuff, but hugely significant in terms of how you keep an institution running and keep people's energy levels and inspiration up when, you know, exhibitions have been cancelled or moved or, you know, you want to do something, but you just can't be, you know, you can't be sure when it's going to happen. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's been really, really confronting. I mean, a number of us, you know, live away from our families and haven't been able to see them for a long time. So there's, there's a lot of human impact in different ways. Um, so that's really forced a re, a rethinking of just daily work and, um, which, you know, but in, at the same token, it's also been very important to, it's brought up a lot of issues, a lot of questions, a lot of concerns that or maybe didn't have time to deal with. And um, I think in the longer term, that'll be incredibly valuable in terms of how we re, how we re sort of think of our way forward. Yeah. Thank you, Russell. Um, I think I will mix it up a bit now and maybe add a question at this point, but just because it seems that, well, of course, we can't um, ignore the the digital acceleration and adoption component of uh, of our discussion, and uh, uh, we have a uh, a question from Vanessa. Uh, this for the presentation. Still, oh, thanks to you, rather, for the presentations today. She's watching from Perth, Australia, and um, she's saying that she's in a secure COVID space. Um, she wishes us all uh, to stay safe and well, and. Uh, uh, she asked the speakers uh, to imagine a post-COVID world and will the digital remain as vital to your planning as institutions or will you revert back to art and physical engagement with the public? And I think this time we'll start with Rosalina because you actually mentioned in your presentation spatial engagement. So uh, I think um, that, that perhaps Rosalina, if you'd like to respond to that question. Oh, you're still on mute, Rosalina. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what, uh, what the future will look like, really. <laughs> um, and I really don't know how. I mean, we all thought that 2021 would be like, OK, it would be cool. I mean, I think for a while we said, oh, in six months, this is going to be over. And then there's another six months. And now it's 2021 and you know there's a new strain happening i'd like to think that um there'll there'll be so much information that we've uploaded on our websites or on the net that it will become an important sort of uh data source for for future um for a future audience or public but i have to say that i actually think that one of the big things that um, this entire thing has uh, taken away from us is this ability to actually engage with art as a physical, tangible space and tangible uh, work and experience. Because art, in the end of the day, at the end of the day, really for me, is a physical engagement. You know, you see it, you, you access it, you move around it, and you know, you smell whatever. And I think this is one thing that. Um, at least I personally continue to start, continue thinking around how, how do we, uh, how do we have our public engage still with art because it's still online, but not have them forget that uh, art is an experience. That's not a flat surface. And I continue to, to, to think around that all the time. Every time we have to put up a show, every time we have to, to uh, put something online, how how do we balance that out? How do we make people not forget that hopefully at some point, maybe if you're even brave enough to come visit the space, to look at it. I, I, I you know, there, 
before COVID or even before the pandemic, everybody's saying, oh, you're just shopping through, through online for art, you know? But then you do realize that there are some exhibitions, there are some works that you can never access just on a flat, on a flat screen. And this will always be the loss of, of, um, of, of this current space and time that we live in. That um, it, it's a loss that we will never be able to to, to regain. No? So I, I I don't know. I think it will be there because we've produced all of this out of necessity and because of 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 uh, of also of belief that art is important. That's why we actually want to bring it out there. But I think at the end of the day, I'd really I I would I look forward to seeing everybody again in an opening <laughs> and seeing work, not just everyone, just but seeing, being surrounded by an exhibition, walking around and, you know, complaining about wall text, I don't know, <laughs> something, but, you know, really like being there. And I look forward to that. But at the moment, I think um, we're pushed to, to come up with all of this content because it's, we, we know that art is important and this is the only way we can continue working with this. But, I, I hope that it doesn't become the norm, that we don't become so lazy, that we don't go out when it's already possible to, to go and visit the show. Thank you, Rosalina. Uh, Russell, just because uh, I always ask you to go last, perhaps you can respond to, to this question. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, the digital will never replace the physical. It can only provide a different experience with it, I guess. And I mean, there's new forms or, you know, recent forms like VR and AR, which I guess is going down another track. Um, and I think that's potentially quite exciting, but the physical experience of art is what we really um, thrive on. And I think the interaction with our peers and our colleagues as, as we go, I mean, it, it's really been a huge, and in terms of inspiration, uh, knowledge gathering, um, sharing of ideas, you know, just the fact that even just to have a conversation with someone, there's no improvising or bumping into somebody, it all has to be booked in and planned. So I think there's a certain, that's a kind of slowing down and the kind of, I guess, systematization of things that I think will really shift how things happen. Um, I think, you know, exhibitions may well have to be longer. Um, you know, we won't be able to circulate work so quickly. I think um, the movement of people across borders will be the last thing I think to change. And um, I mean, things may change within local contexts, but I think internationally, it'll still take another few years, I think. So uh, yeah, I think these longer term engagements, which I think could be really valuable, will be a really um, key thing that comes out of this. Thank you, Russell. And uh, perhaps we'll go to Ali. I know you already shared some of your struggles um, with digitization, but, uh, but Ali, did you have anything else uh, to share uh, in reference to the question? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think one of uh, the good thing or the positive side of somehow being forced to do something online is also here in the context of the practice art making in Jogja is also the idea of we have to change. We have, to, because many of the artists in Jogja, they still work with quite conventional medium. I mean, even if you ask how many artists working with new media, like new media was founded like maybe 30 years ago, but still it's not, uh, still not uh, dominant numbers in the practice of art scene in Jogja. But then with the situation, somehow we give also uh, new opportunities for the younger generation that is maybe they're more native to the digital world. So I think this also giving us the uh, different way of looking into art practice. And I found because during the 2020, we did also a series of uh, art classes for curators, for uh, younger uh, generation of artists and also collectives. 
And as the end or as conclusion of these classes, we created an exhibition that collaborates all those curator, young curators, young artists, and collective. And I found many interesting ideas from young artists that I never found out before when I, when my practice as curator still thinking in quite a conservative way of uh, selecting artists. So for example, there was one work that uh, created a museum from Minecraft. So he used the Minecraft game and then created a virtual museum and then uh, with the discussion of the curator, we create the narrative for the artist and this become a new conversation for the gamer themselves. So this, be I think in a way, it's a good platform for extending the audience of the arts, not only people that usually come to the art world but also, or art exhibition, but so now we have lots of young, uh, young people uh, work working in the games or in the digital platform, also uh, they start to access art world. So I think in a way there are many positive sides as well, instead of only focusing on the negative or the challenges and difficulties, as I mentioned before. And in the other side, I think it is important as well to, as mentioned by Joselina, to find the balance between this uh, capability to uh, accelerate with the digital world and at the same time also keeping our collective memories of physical exhibition. Because when we did the exhibition, uh, when we prepared the display and every artist, they said, oh, we miss so much being on the exhibition space and together with other artists and art handlers and everyone and just to hang the artworks. So it's not only the, it's not only the audience that miss the activities coming to galleries, but for artists also, I think uh, they're, they're really hoping that the situation will be enable them to, uh, to create physical exhibition. So I think I agree with Joselina. We don't really have to force ourselves just to see digital as replacement of physical, but it's more like uh, thinking about the relevant situation one as challenge, but at the same time as opportunities. Yeah. Thank you, Alia. And uh, Aaron, if you'd like to have the last word on that question. No, I, I agree with what um, all my colleagues have said. I think that, I think it's really, I think Alia's point is really clear that that um, as frustrating as all of, all of the digital can be, that there is that silver lining. And, um, um, you know, we do hope to be able to, to make physical exhibitions again, but at the moment, this is this is where we're at. Um, so yeah, let's just make the, let's be optimistic and make the most of what we have right now. Thank you, Aaron. Um, uh, most of, the, so we do have some other questions. Most of them we have covered in our discussion already, but there is uh, one question I think that I think affects us all. And uh, uh, it's about, um, it's about education actually and about uh, how in this current environment, uh, the challenges of knowledge uh, distribution uh, and of being a young person, you know, and accessing education or, or educational resources, uh, how institutions are actually dealing with this. Um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, we might start with um, Aaron again uh, and then go in the same order as we usually do. Yeah, I think it's just a really great question, actually. And I think that it does um, tie back into that last question about what the future, is, whether or not we're going to bounce back to all physical or all, all digital. Because I think that what this period has shown us is that we're relying on um, different forms or different different modalities of communicating with art right now. And, ed and education is really one of the, the key things. I mean, you can go on anyone's um, uh, website or Instagram page or whatever, and you will find educational material now. So I actually think in many ways, it's um, despite all of the, the um, economic and social factors that, that might be barriers for people to engage with, with um, digital material, it is an opportunity for people to, to have much more, much more access. I mean, it, it's, it's, right, it's right there. Um, 
um, in, in, in front of us. I think for, for young people, and, and this came up in, in a number of other, other panels as well, be, it, young people have, this is a real opportunity for young people as well, because that they understand this digital environment much better than a middle-aged man does. Or um, I think that, that, that it, it, it potentially opens up um, new ways of working within, the, within these cultural spaces, which may actually be more embracing of, of younger minds. Um, I mean, let's hope anyway. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Alia? Yeah, I think I, ag I agree with uh, Aaron in a way in the, con in the relation with education, digital platform is very useful because uh, most of the time we consider digital is the secondary methods of uh, working with uh, you know, audience. But I found out during one year period of this pandemic that uh, we can create many uh, new, new, met new method of learning. I did lots of classes during the pandemic, like for example, some uh, there, there are classes on architecture. So they invited me every, almost five times every Friday. And this never happened before because the, they never think that they can invite guest lecture uh, by online. And it's kind of a new introduction for them also to understand the relationship between architecture and contemporary art. So there are many opportunities of learning from uh, the primary hand at the same time. And, but also I found, uh, as I mentioned before to the panelists here, since I personally moved to more village area, I created also another uh, circle where art physically being part of the everyday life of uh, this villager. So instead of thinking about the usual uh, audience of artists or art, uh, uh, I also try to create another way to connect with the community that is totally different from what we see virtually. So my neighbors here, they are all uh, farmers, they are working as laborers in the factory, so uh, it, I invited them to see some uh, works in, in my space. So I think and this, this kind of conversation also uh, happened, like if there is no pandemic, I, I don't think that I will really use my space as a uh, places for people to come and learn about art. So I think this has to, like in a place like Jogja, where you have the opportunity to reach people digitally, but at the same time, the real situation, the social reality in the community needs to be responded uh, as strong as the digital one. So you cannot, uh, for me, I cannot really choose which one that I need to do now, but uh, we try to, to use those two platform together in different, uh, different uh, urgency. Thank you, Alia. Uh, Rosalina? Oh, Rosalina, you're still on mute. So education, yeah. I mean, we are part of a, um, of a university, so it is actually um, integral. And um, we have uh, some uh, tutors from the college reaching out to us use some of our material for their, for their classes. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's such an important um, thing. And we actually were, as I said in, at the start of my presentation, we've moved away from the idea of education and we were thinking more, uh, looking at the more general way of uh, generalized and less um, um, a different approach to uh, to um, putting out uh, information rather than us telling you how things are to be seen, etc. Really, how how can we learn from each other? And we were embarking on this on this um, on this app, and uh, 
we sort of had to move back. Just now the exchange is. Uh, so, Rosalina, I think you might need to come closer to your microphone. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but because there's but, but because it's been um, it sort of set us back from the uh, move forward. I think not move forward or back, but it's just sort of like I said, this it slowed it down. Uh, and because now all of the information is coming from us, and we have to start giving it out in a more traditional way. We were still giving out the information rather than this much quicker uh, engagement with what can you share with us? Because it's a different, uh, it's no longer, it's not personal. So the, as, as uh, I mean, it was very, it was very interesting when you said, um, uh, Russell, that engagement is now systematized. <laughs> you know, we can't just be spontaneous and just say, you know what? Uh, and that I think is what we've lost. And I, and we were, I mean, I know we, we there are many positives to this entire thing, but um, I, I miss that. I, I was hoping that we would have a more uh, fluid way of uh, doing learning in the museum. And it's now sort of, you know, we have to think of that in another, uh, in another, in another time perhaps, or we have to, figure out how it's going to be pushed forward. But we do have stu uh, teachers and tutors in the uh, university asking us to work with them. And of course, all online, of course. Um, internships are online. <laughs> we have online interns, uh, everything. No? That's all I can say about that. Thank you, Rosalina. Uh, Russell? Yeah, I mean, quite similar to what's been shared by others. I mean, yeah, I mean, we were definitely trying to move away from this more top-down way of education. And I mean, we have quite an established education program anyway, a number of different levels and different age groups. Um, and I think, yeah, now we're having to really produce content and put it out there, you know, from us. Um, but I think it does, I mean, certainly this engagement that we're trying to really build, and this will take more time, um, will hopefully in the longer term give us opportunities to have more co-creation, more um, inputs from our publics. And um, I mean, we have a community access team that's fairly new. I mean, that was set up not long before the pandemic. And, you know, they've been developing programs with say the domestic worker, community, for example, you know, trying to reach out to very specific and different communities and shaping programming around them. <coughs> and certainly what we've learned from, from them will, is, is definitely feeding back into, you know, what we can do or how we could talk about our exhibitions. And I mean, as we're focusing more on local exhibition programming, you know, the research that we're doing, we're trying to sort of uncover certain histories that may have been hidden or overlooked. Um, I think in terms of our curatorial process, we've got a lot to learn from our publics as well. And that's something we really want to start to build in more actively into our curatorial and research um, as well as we go, which then I guess will feed out into the education program in another way. Yeah. Thank you, Russell. Um, so uh, it's getting quite close to dinner time for some of our speakers and to some and to some of the people who are listening in now, of course. So I think we will uh, start to wrap up. So I just, on behalf of Museum Machan and Connect ASEAN, I would like to uh, heartily thanks our speakers for sharing their time with us today. Also, thank you to everyone who has joined us virtually um, uh, for this uh, conversation. We truly appreciate your time and uh, uh, please, um, uh, I will give the floor back to Widi uh, from Museum Macha. And uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you again soon in person, hopefully. <laughs> thank you very much, Ben. Thank you for, so much for moderating this event. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank all the speakers as well. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, uh, Amalia. Thank you, um, Ms. Hoselina. And thank you, Mr. Russell, for uh, spending your time with us. It was a very great discussion. We actually have more questions than uh, Ben has to ask. Uh, delivered from just now but unfortunately the time is reaching dinner time as ben said <laughs> maybe some of us is already hungry i can tell the chicken from alias video is already hungry 
<laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I'll wrap up this uh, program. Thank you very much, everyone who stayed with us for very long as well for two hours. Um, please stay safe. Also, stay healthy. Please uh, look forward to other uh, Museum Machan and Connect ASEAN programs in the next month. We'll have another program and another program in the next month as well. Uh, thank you very much and have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>